Go this way, you go that way. Good morning. <laughs> we all got our vocal cords warmed up, ready to go. Let's open up our hymnals this morning to hymn number 27. Rejoice in pure in heart. It's a long, complicated thing. 
was, I'm amazed she could even write it down. But one of the things I was also thinking of after I read this letter, and I read it two or three times, you know, as a jail ministry, we go to be with these people and to aid them and to show them a video and try and answer any of their prayers and find out what their needs are. But what Mary's doing here, all of us could do. Because we have names and we have numbers and we have an address for the Cowles County Jail. Any one of us or all of us could sit down even if they have only one side of one page like this and write a letter to somebody in the jail of encouragement. I think it would be amazing what that would do. Because we're only there two, maybe three Sabbaths out of a whole month. Letters can come six days a week. And I know I remember, I haven't thought about it even recently, And it's kind of sad. I, mean, I go to the mailbox now, and, and what do I go for? I go to get junk mail, lots of that, and bills. That's it. And when I was a kid, every day was an exciting day to go to the mailbox huh. to see if somebody sent you a letter, or to send a letter to somebody. You know, even if they were sending for a Captain whatever space ring off your cereal box. <laughs> you would come by, you know, a lot happened. And now that we've got iPhones and computers, all that stuff, so much of that has gone away. But it doesn't need to go away because the people in the jails don't have that stuff. Send them a letter of encouragement. So with that said, now, let's see, this is page, page, okay, page two out of five and a half. I'll just read some highlight stuff. I was thrilled to find you had written to me. Thank you. And thank you for putting me before your church and for prayer and for your personal daily prayers. I am so honored and humbled and so full of gratitude for you and my heart swells with an indescribable love. I want you to know that it's been your ministry over all these years that has anchored my faith and has immensely helped to bring my heart, my spirit, and my mind in alignment with Jesus. I know that I am truly loved and cherished and that he indeed does have a marvelous plan for me. For all of us, if we we'll only let him, I see him in everything. Now, when she talks about so many years, I saw somewhere in the letter, um, I don't know what it was, but Mary, did you start writing to her like in 2003 or 2004? No, I don't remember. I know it's been quite a while. And then she goes on and she talks about some of the jail stuff, and she says, I entirely give it all to God. Only God, I am so blessed beyond description. They give them things, give them things that they have to memorize to help them through the rest of their life. And she says, it isn't easy by any means, but it's a gift of God to be embraced through the program. And Christ is my power greater than myself. I believe we are being purified molded and softened here, sharpened there, and loved completely. And I am loved. I know this. I wish my daughter Kaylee, my granddaughter Olivia, and my grandson Andrew would somehow, some way, come to know Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Personally, so much. Kaylee is so unhappy, exhausted, depressed, working full-time raising her two plus and Michael's two children. I don't know who Michael is. Two are autistic in different ways. 
No breaks in sight. And it's still the weakening point. Please keep them in your prayers and know you're in mine too.
and visit with people. And you have to go through that because there's quite a lengthy protocol as to what you can do, what you can't do, what you can't bring, how to treat the inmates, you know, not sharing their names with their other people, you know, just a lot of stuff. So if you're interested, that's coming up. So you can talk to me or talk to Mary and check your bulletin. It's at the Collins County Jail right across from Justice Center on First Street in Kelso. Thank you.
at work. He was working as a cook at a restaurant because he finished his culinary training, which the Second Chance Center paid him to go to. And yesterday he got his first paycheck. So he hasn't had a paycheck in, you know, I don't know how many years. He hasn't had a paycheck. So what do you suppose a criminal would do with their first paycheck when they now love the Lord? It amazed me. He has had nothing. I have sent him more gift cards to buy clothes. I mean, he's had nothing. And he told me that he wants to start paying me back. I said, you know, you can take care of you for right now. You know, later on. And he sent a gift package of food to his cellmate in prison that I sent the Bible two years ago. He's 32 years old and he's serving life without the possibility of parole. He went in when he was 18. But there was a problem. Not all attorneys are good attorneys. His case has been brought up for review. And next week, there's a possibility they will make him uh, change his status so he would be eligible for parole. So, how amazing this for the paycheck. He's giving money to somebody that's in prison. That's just, praise the Lord, he's truly converted. sharing that, Dina. Inspiring stories. Praying for him for years, right? Yeah, keep praying, guys. You never know where it's going to work out. Those prayers are going somewhere good. And uh, we can see now that he is indeed a converted man. He's, he's working. Um, he's, you know, and that's what they say. If you're truly converted, the first thing on your mind, and when you get a chance, is going to be, you know, how to help others and what you know he's doing. It. Praise God. Um, very inspiring, thank you. And indeed, anybody who has a, a, something they want to share during this time, please uh, don't be uh, shy about uh, letting me know beforehand so we can get you a little time. These are the these are the things we remember. These are the, we, we remember the stories. I, there's the, uh, um, a Adventist educator, his name is Dave Fiedler. He uh, taught for years and years, and brilliant guy, actually. I love listening to him, but he says, when he comes back to his students, what do they remember? They remember the stories. You know, they remember the education too, but it's the stories that make an impact. So please do share those with us, friends. We'd like to hear them. Um, thank you. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming today. Welcome to our, our church, the Castle Rock Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you for uh, joining us online. If you're out there, uh, joining us over the airwaves, come and join us here sometime. We would love to have you here with us. and make your acquaintance. Um, are there any announcements today? Yes, Ron. Just a quick announcement. If you just have nothing to do tomorrow morning, you would like to come down and help us fill in a ditch. Uh, we took out some gigantic aluminum wire that was about the size of my finger, 14 of them, by the way. It goes between the back room and the sanctuary up here, and we put in conduit and copper lines. And so we have power up here, we have heat in the baptistry even. Um, but now it would be nice if we could get a few people to help us fill in that ditch and get it packed in and closed up and look at nice. So if you'd like to, if you know how to operate, how many of you know how to operate shovels? That's what I thought. Then a very easy on-off switch, right, on the shovel. So feel free to come out probably about 9 o'clock tomorrow, and it will just be a, probably a very short job to, to get that ditch closed up. So thank you. So we should bring the shovel with us. Yes? Yeah, yeah, you can. We've got and, to do it here. And for those of us who need some instruction, you will, you will provide that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh,
We see it out there. Thank you for your hard work, and uh, we'd love to join in. By the way, that is a good time for fellowship, uh, men and women working together to uh, uh, shore up the Lord's house. It's a very good thing to do for us spiritually. So, <laughs> and we'll have uh, meat in the baptistry. When I was baptized those years ago, there was no heat in there at that time, so I don't know if it's been that long, uh, but it'll be nice. Um, any other announcements today? Okay, let's continue with our worship service. Uh, let us then uh, be in silent prayer as we on the platform meet.
far as possible, let us be in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us through another week and for this Sabbath day, uh, for creating, it, creating a day, Lord, that uh, we can draw closer to you. We thank you and we claim the promise that you would draw nigh to us as well. We think of those, Lord, today who couldn't be with us here due to illness or injury or for some other reason. We pray, Lord, that they would know that they would be comforted, uh, that you indeed are with them on this Sabbath day, and that you are interested in their lives. Um, Lord, we know that um, this little church here in Castle Rock, you have asked us to be a shining light uh, to this community, and to all that we come in contact with, and Lord, we humbly ask that you would inspire us to be just that. We know that this could only happen through a living connection with you, so we pray, Lord, earnestly, that each of us, daily, today included, would give our lives completely over to you, so that you can be seen through us, so that you can work through us. We ask, Lord, uh, for a blessing upon the ministries that we have within this church, the jail ministry, the outreach that we do, the community service, and for each of us that are working as individuals, we ask, Lord, for, um, for you to be seen through us, that in each of these situations, uh, that our words would be just right, uh, that the countenance would be just right, and that people would be attracted to you as you work through us. We know that getting ourselves out of the way is the only way that this can happen. So we thank you for thank you for your willingness to be um, to be part of our lives and to work through these humble instruments. We ask for your blessing today, Lord, in this in this worship service right here. We pray that um, your Spirit would be among us and guide us. We ask for your special blessing for our speaker, Stan, that you would bless his words that your principles would be upheld, and that we would leave this place uh, knowing more about you and ourselves, and have a great understanding of what it is, and what we need to do to spread the gospel to this dark world. Thank you, Lord, for being involved in everything we do, and for working through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you so much uh, for 
the things that you give us, the means that you give us to help. Uh, we know that this is a blessing to us as well as a blessing uh, to those areas where it is received. We ask, Lord, that it would be multiplied, that it would work in a mighty way, and that those who are touched by it would know you and know salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. There's also some small baskets at the end of the pew. If you want to add a little dramatic basket to the center, the funds that are received here will go to help out some orphans that we sponsor in Central America. you are here. Would you like to sit right here with me? Yes. Sit right here and tell a story? Well, have you seen, Ava, have you ever seen a little squirrel? Have you seen a little squirrel? Oh, I have one in my car, but I didn't know I needed it. Do you know what a squirrel looks like? A little brown squirrel? I was driving up my road a couple days ago and I live up a mountain. It's going up my mountain and up my mountain. And a little squirrel came running out onto the road. Now I drive a big white truck thing. Big white truck, and then how big is a squirrel? Squirrel's little. Is a squirrel little? It's smaller than a cat, right? And that squirrel, he came running straight for my car. And then you know what he did? He jumped straight in the air and turned and zoomed back into the woods. Just like that. And I thought, wow. You know, the Bible says to resist the devil, to flee from the devil, and to draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to us. And that little squirrel, when he saw the danger, it's just like when we see sin, we should turn and run the other direction. Just like that little squirrel saw something was wrong, and he turned and ran the other direction. So when we make good choices and turn away from things that 
that aren't good. The Bible says we draw nigh to God. We draw close to God. And he draws close to us in our heart because Jesus loves us. So you draw nigh to God every day, okay? And then he will draw nigh to you, okay? And I have a little squirrel in my car, and I'm going to go get it for you, okay? Then you can remember this story, to draw nigh to God always. Okay. Thank you for listening.
Jacob leaving his home because he has deceived his father and stolen the birthright. You remember that? And now he comes to the point in time where he's headed back to the promised land, so to speak, his own home country that was, that was promised to Abraham. And so as he makes this return, um, he has a number of ghosts in his past that are haunting him. First and foremost, that he has to meet his brother Esau. You will recall that the last scenario that we're familiar with, that he's in the company of Esau, is one filled with absolute tension. And even hatred, particularly on the part of Esau, because Jacob has stolen his birthright and his blessing. This is a little sidetrack, but when you think about the book of Genesis, and particularly what happens as God begins creation, blessing is what he gives to Adam and Eve, right? And to the earth. He wants us all to be blessed. And this promise of blessing, of course, comes down to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis. And then is carried on uh, all the way through the book and into Exodus. That's what God wants to do, uh, is bless his people in all the acts that he carries out for them and giving them the Ten Commandments and so, so on and so forth. And so this, this core theme of blessing uh, in Genesis is really at the center of what Jacob is hoping to get from God. And at this, point, at this point in his life, he still does not have an assurance of God's blessing. And that's really tragic because it's been at least 20-some years since he left home. Quite a long time. And this is unresolved. But it says here in verse 1, Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. That is profound, and that is very interesting, because he has just left Laban, his father-in-law, who is the uncle of deceit itself. <laughs> A mirror of Jacob times 10, really, um, in terms of deceit. So he's just left that. And it says he's on his way. And what does it say right there in that first, first verse of Genesis 32, verse 1? Who met him? Angels. Whoa. I don't know if any of you have angel stories. I've had some incidents where I've thought maybe I've seen angels. But if you've had an experience like that, that would have an incredible impact on your life, right? Interestingly enough, um, in both the encounter that Jacob has with God and with angels when he departs from his home, at his mother's bidding, you need to leave here, you're not going to live, um, that first night out, guilty Jacob is met by a vision as he lays on that stone pillar of angels going up and down the ladder. There's a connection, God is saying. Jacob, I'm with you. There's a connection. There's, there's angels that are ministering and interceding, in a sense, on your behalf in, in this experience. And I'm going to go with you through it. Uh, both, both these incidents, what happens at Bethel with the, with the angels uh, on the stair way to heaven, so to speak, uh, and in this confrontation that he will have with Esau, um, there are angels and there's Esau involved and they both happen to Jacob alone at night. The worst visions seem to come to us at night. So that's in the background. But I want to just have your memories, because most of you will remember this, not all of you, that more than two decades ago, there was a major military confrontation over in Iraq and Kuwait that resulted in what we remember as Desert Storm. You remember Desert Storm? 
Saddam Hussein, who was the president of Iraq at the time, um, said this. He predicted this as he anticipated the battle. He said, it will be the mother of all battles. <laughs> well, it wasn't the mother of all battles. It was a terrific defeat. In fact, as his troops were run out of Kuwait, they were fearful. They were surrendering to anything they could surrender to, including drones that were going over, trying to wave them in. Uh, it was certainly not the mother of all battles. And it was quickly over. But I remember that incident because it was during that time that, uh, and hearing what Saddam Hussein was saying, I thought about this little comment from Steps to Christ, which is really about the mother of all battles. <laughs> You're familiar with this little comment. This is what the servant of the Lord says. She says, the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. Amen. Well, the yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. The mother of all battles is really the great controversy, isn't it? Between Christ and Satan, that really is the mother of all battles. But in a smaller microcosm in our own life, as is said here, the greatest battle is the battle that happens between us and God. The war for the soul. Paul says the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from do doing what you would. And it's this lesson of surrender to God, that battle for complete surrender, that's the battle all of us have to fight almost every day of our life, and then eventually uh, and finally uh, in the final day, the day of uh, the time of the end. And every day God is trying to lead us in this experience of, of surrender, total surrender. And that's what he was trying to do with Jacob as we, as we look, and, and look into this story, come into this story. This story is kind of a type of an antitype. That is a prefigurement of J Jacob's experience is a prefigurement of what we as God's people, if we're still alive when he comes, I tend to believe that's going to happen, but I don't know are going to have to experience. So, um, I have to say this, I am very glad that I will never be pregnant. It's never going to happen, I promise you. Never going to happen. I'm glad my wife was able to do that for us. <laughs> but it's interesting because Jeremiah paints a picture in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. He says, Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with a child? And of course the answer is no. It doesn't happen. So why do I see, Jeremiah says, so why do I see every man with hands on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turn pale? Not a pretty picture, is it? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. But, there's the good news. He shall be what? Saved out. So I know that this, this specter sometimes looms very large in Adventist minds because we're kind of unique in understanding that this is something that, that we will face. And sometimes it creates fear that is unwarranted. I will come back to that. But I would like to suggest to you that Jacob's trouble started a long time before this narrative that we're going to read, that we're going to read. We know that Jacob's name means to supplant or to grasp. And his brother Esau combines it really with deceit. 
He is the epitome of deceit itself, Esau seems to say, uh, when he discovers that Jacob has stolen his birthright. But the reality is, is that both Jacob and Esau have the same problem. One was greedy. That would probably be Esau. And one was grabby, and that would be Jacob. <laughs> greedy and grabby with the same problem. Self-centered, self-dependent, manipulating, whatever it takes to get the way you want, to get whatever you want. Having the natural instincts of self-serving, self-promoting, and self-preserving. And uh, Jacob had sharpened his skills uh, on his brother and on his father and then on Laban before he departs and comes to this point in his life. So in verse uh, 6, um, we'll just skip down here. It says, And messengers returned to Jacob, because he'd sent messengers ahead to Esau, saying, I'm coming, saying, we, we came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and there are 400 men with him. And then Jacob was greatly afraid, afraid and distressed. Now, wait a minute, stop. This is just a few verses after it says that angels had met him. Sometimes we can, we, we can have wonderful spiritual experiences, and then something happens, and it's very easy to default to fear, isn't it? You would think, well, you know, he saw angels uh, encamped around him, so to speak, and yet that wasn't enough. And now he is greatly, greatly fearful. And so he sends this, this huge number of animals ahead to appease um, Esau. But in verse 9 it says, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Return to your country and your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love, and all the faithfulness that you have shown your servant, for with only my staff I crossed the Jordan, and now I've become two camps. So Jacob is coming to a point in his life where he realizes something really, really important, and that is that he is not worthy of the gifts that God gives. You ever tried to be thankful? Can you force yourself to be thankful? Not really. You have to recognize that you are getting better than you deserve to be truly thankful. Or truly worthy of what you get. And Jacob is coming very close to God when he says, I am not worthy of what you give me. Now we see in verse 13 and down, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but he says, droves and droves of animals ahead of him to appease his brother. Can you imagine? Uh, any of you heard goats? Yeah? I, I never have done that, but 200 goats here, um, and 20 male goats, and 200 ewes, and 20 rams, and 30 milking camels. 30 milking camels would be a lot to handle and there are calves and cows and bulls, and it goes on and on. And uh, he does this, he says in verse 20, um, the idea is to appease him. An interesting word, the word appease, it's translating a Hebrew word which is kapur. Have you ever heard of Yom Kippur? Day of Atonement. So this is a gift of atonement that Jacob sends ahead. He's trying to atone for what he has done to Esau in the past. So what he sends him is really a, a symbol, a recognition of what he stole from Esau. He can't spiritually atone, but he can physically atone to his brother for what he has done. And so, hence, 
all the gifts, not to mention that he knows that these herds will slow Esau's progress because he's going to have to take care of all these animals and hurt all these animals, buys Jacob a bit of time. I like the comment that Derek Kidner um, who writes a commentary on Genesis says, he says, the conflict brought to head the battling and groping of a lifetime, this, this potential conflict that he has with Esau, uh, brings to head the battling and, gro and groping of a lifetime. And Jacob's desperate embrace vividly expressed his ambivalent attitude to the God of love and enmity, defiance, and dependence. On his way to his brother, who he wants to appease, Jacob must deal with his God. And what this highlights is that our relationship with God is so tied up with our relationship to our brothers and sisters that it cannot almost be separated. And when we think about the two tables of the law, what are they? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're out of harmony with either one, you, either one you don't get the balance, do you? And so that's where Jacob finds himself in this situation. And the face of Esau looms up in front of him like some giant king Kong. And, and he's, he's scared spitless because he knows his brother is probably still angry even after 21 years. I remember it as though it's yesterday. It's just crystal clear in my mind. Um, he was my teacher. He was six foot two, uh, weighed about 225, and he had red hair and piercing eyes. Um, I was about four foot ten and 80 pounds all wet. I had uh, drawn a picture of him in the class and passed it around that was not flattering. And I'll never forget him signaling to me and taking me into his office. It was a time of trouble. <laughs> and so Jacob, you know, in a sense has this, this time of trouble because it's Esau's face looming before him in this situation. Down in verse 22. The same night he arose and took his two wives and his two female servants and his eleven children and crossed the fort of Jacob. And he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. But no, not really. Not really. Now, <clears throat> it says here, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of of the day. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But in this wrestling contest that, that happens, remember that Jacob at this point is probably 97 years old. You realize that? In the chronology, he's about 97 years old. I've always visioned him as this you know, young, strong guy, maybe 45 or 50, not really thinking about the chronology. He was probably about 70 years old when he deceived his father and stole the birthright tend to compress these, these narratives and, and not remember there's long periods of time that go by. And so he's no, as my mother would say, spring chicken. Uh, he's, he's already 97. Anybody here 97? 90? 90? Good. Praise the Lord. Looking good. We have uh, one of our congregations, our village church down in Portland, the average age of the congregation is 90. The average age is 90, and they've had uh, a number of centurions, and uh, they're amazing. They are truly amazing, the gifts they have and how they carry on there. But anyway, sidetrack, sorry. <laughs> um, so, Jacob begins, it says, to have a wrestling match, match with a man. <laughs> and I love this picture, because... It's a picture of God being just like 
us because we know who this man is. And it's not just an angel, probably Christ. <laughs> but he's called a man. There are two terms for man in the Old Testament. And you'll remember when Adam was created, God gave him a name, Adam. Adam means man. There's another word for man that's just, just um, well, Adam is in Hebrew, Adam, okay? Adam, we transliterate to Adam. Second word for man is not a very nice sounding word, it's ish. <laughs> Ish. And ish is what is used here. And ish in the Bible is man in his weakness. It's not man in the, in, in the primal power of his creation. It's man in his weakness. And this picture is Jesus becoming like us. Wrestling with us where we're at. And in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. He's not pictured as Adam. He's pictured as Ish, one like us, one who we would not recognize as God or desire, but one like us. The contrast with what he could be in his divine power. But taking human form to relate to us all. And it's interesting because in this story, it is him who initiates the attack. It's not Jacob. Jacob's totally taken by surprise by this incident. And so they wrestle. And it says, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint. Now, clearly, this is not a physical battle. This is a spiritual battle, because by one simple touch, the man could have put Jacob out of commission at the beginning. But there's a goal. He has a goal. He has to bring Jacob to a certain point. And it says that while they were wrestling... As this process is going on, he touches the hip, but the wrestling keeps going. Jacob is crippled, but he keeps going. He keeps wrestling. I like this comment from one of our Adventist scholars. She says, God's weakness in his confrontation with humans is an expression of his grace and love and of the mystery of his incarnation to reach out to humans to save them. Let me read that again. God's weakness in his confrontation with humans is an expression of his grace and love and of the mystery of his incarnation to reach out to humans to save them. Any of you uh, grow up wrestling? Or been a wrestler? All right. Now, I never was a wrestler, but I wrestled with my brother. The word wrestle in the Hebrew language literally means dust. Because it's a picture of what happens when you wrestle. <laughs> you get down and, and you get into it. And you know if you're wrestling with somebody, that's about as close as you can get. I mean, it's toe-to-toe, -to nose-to-nose, -nose, even nose-to-armpit sometimes. Sweat mixing. And that's what's happening in this picture. In connection with uh, this story, it's important to remember that even though Jeremiah paints this time of Jacob's trouble as a fearsome time, the Bible says he will be saved out of it. And the important thing to remember is that 
When God wrestles with us, he has his grip on us first. He cares first. And he's there. You can't get any closer than wrestling. He's with us. He's not against us. Jesus said to, to Peter on the Passover weekend, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. That's what's happening here in Jacob's story. One of my, one of my favorite parts of the, the Passover weekend is that Jesus prays for Pilate's wife and for Pilate. Where did he find the time to do that? Where did he find the care to do that? In the midst of his own suffering, he's so far ahead of us. He was so far ahead of his disciples. Going back, Grandpa Abraham's ram is, is already in the bush. When God says, take your, take your beloved son and sacrifice. Youth instructor, May 24, 1900. Inspiration's comment. When he, that is Jacob, cast himself on the mercy of God, he found instead of being in the hands of the enemy, he was encircled in the arms of infinite love. Isn't that a great picture? I like that. And so it's at this moment, Jacob realizing who he's really wrestling with, and his whole lifetime coming to a climax at this moment, this struggle between his will, his manipulation, his grasping spirit, and surrender to God, as it comes to that moment, he becomes, he goes from being grasper to gripper. He's got a grip on God. <laughs> it was read in our scripture, when we are weak, then we are strong. Hard lesson for us to learn. So hard for us to learn. I love what uh, Sister Ellen says about this thing. She says, live the life of faith day by day. Do not become anxious and distressed about the time of trouble and thus have a time of trouble beforehand. Do not keep thinking, I'm afraid I shall not stand in the great testing day. That's, that's not faith, is it? To say, oh, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it. Where's the focus? Wrong place, right? Do not keep thinking, I'm afraid I shall not stand in the great testing day. You are to live for the present, for this day only. Tomorrow is not yours. Today you are to maintain the victory over sin. Today you are to live a life of prayer. Today you are to fight the good fight of faith. Today you are to believe that God blesses you. And as you gain the victory over darkness and unbelief, you will meet the requirements of the Master and will become a blessing to those around you. That's beautiful, isn't it? Reference. That is, um, I've lost it, here we go. That is Science of the Times, October 20, 1887. Science of the Times, October 20, 1887. Just before the 1888 conference. And of course, this, this angel, Jesus, cannot resist this person. But he recognizes as the day breaks that they really can't be completely face to face. And so in verse 26, he says, let me go, for the day has broken. An interesting force of the terminology here, the translation is a good one, but the, the Hebrew verb is, a, is, is, is an intensive, which literally means send me away, push me away. It's like an invitation, almost, I don't like to use the word tease, but almost like that. 
push me away. And Jacob says, I will not let you go and bless you, bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? Uh-oh. Name represents character. He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men. Again, this combination that when we strive with God, ultimately we end up striving with men. And if you think about Cain and Abel in their experience, because Cain did not recognize salvation in what had been promised in Genesis 3.15, because he didn't see God in that, he was unthankful. And the result of his unthankful and, and lack of recognition of, of the Savior killed his brother. Similar dynamics here. Same problem. But a wonderful solution. And that is total surrender to God. Israel. We have a whole nation by the name of Israel. What does Israel mean? Have you ever thought about what the term means? We know how it's interpreted here. Israel means literally God fights. God fights. But who's really doing the fighting here? It's Jacob, isn't it? It's Jacob. Jacob wrestles with God, and yet Jacob wrestles with man, as we've already talked about. But here is the, here's the neat thing about the story. The man dislocates Jacob's hip, and yet Jacob prevails. Because it's a spiritual battle that's going here, not a physical battle. And how does Jacob prevail? He prevails by self-surrender. He prevails by self-surrender. That is the only way that he can overcome. And God loves to give a blessing to needy people. And our only claim, our only claim to his mercy is our great need. That's it. That's it. Can't offer anything else but your need. And God cannot resist that. You lean on him and you grasp him, he will bless you. God says you shall no longer be called Jacob and Israel, for you have striven with men, with God and with men, and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him, please tell me what you, your name. <laughs> and he says, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him. So this is the outcome of this type that we'll experience if we are alive when Jesus comes as an antitype. And the beauty of the experience is that God will be intimately close to us in that experience. As close as a wrestler, he will have his grip on us. And if we will throw ourselves at his feet, if we will be in surrender to him, if we will lean on him, we will come away as the victors. Alexander Carolyn had not lost a wrestling match in 13 years. This great Soviet wrestler had three gold medals from successive Olympics to boast. He weighed 286 pounds. He was solid muscle. He could pick up a 300 man, pound man and slam him to the mat. He was so intimidating that on two occasions in Olympic uh, contests, two of his, of his adversaries literally laid down on the floor and surrendered themselves. They pinned themselves to the floor so they wouldn't have to deal with him. It was like taking on a tank. Until a little man, not so little, from Wyoming, Wyoming, a farm boy by the name of Rulon Gardner came along. And Rulon could
could pick up two 100-pound bells with his right hand and two hundred and two 100-pound bells in his left hand and walk away easily with them. And at the 2000 uh, Olympics in Sydney, Australia, he came up in the gold medal match against Alexander Carroll. And he leaned, and he leaned, and he leaned, and he grasped to the point that Alexander Carolyn became exhausted and literally dropped his hands and backed off and lost the match. And I see in that picture the key for us in victory with God. He's not intimidating like Alexander Carroll. <laughs> He's a loving God. But as we lean, as we lean, as we grasp, He's happy to surrender to us and embrace us with his love. And so there's the key in our lives from going from grasping, which we tend to be by human nature, to grippers who can face whatever comes in the last days and be victorious in God's strength. So we have a lot to be thankful for, and we're going to sing um, Come Ye Thankful People 557. 557. He went to jail. He went to jail. That's right. <laughs> He's incarcerated the boy. All right. Number 557. Come, be thankful people. Thank you. 
because of what you have done through Jesus in this earth, we can have a hope for that great harvest day that goes far beyond anything that we, that we celebrate here. But in the meantime, we're, we're thankful for every gift that you give us, uh, for your guidance, for your closeness to us, that you're with us. You are truly God with us. And as we look at this story of Jacob, we realize that whatever we face, if we will, if we will reach out to you and grasp you, you're, you're already there, you're already embracing us, you're way ahead of us, and you will be with us. And so we thank you for that assurance and for those promises. And Lord, I want to thank you for this church, its witness, the things that have been shared this morning that are, that are miraculous and wonderful and, and are ministering to people in this community. Lord, bless those efforts. Bless every effort here for people to understand the three angels' message and to know Jesus and, and to want to be ready when he comes. And so bless us on this, your Sabbath as we go out of here and anticipate another week that the rest we receive in being in your presence will we refresh us in some, such a way that people see uh, your goodness. And so we thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen.